Hello Blood Bowl fans, I see BBL players and anybody else who happens to be watching this game. Yes, I'm doing this for Luck of the Dice as well. We're going to do the rundown for the first week of the Cup. Luck of the Dice this week. Let's get right into it and have a look at the schedule for this week. The week that's been played at least. So we've got Fake's Chaos. Uh, yeah, let's explain it first. Sorry, Luck of the Dice is a game where 16 coaches all get a random team assigned to them from the 16 different races. So each team has a race that they're not particularly comfortable with necessarily. Sometimes they are, sometimes they're not. It all depends on how lucky you are with the team that you roll. 16 coaches, 16 races, only one of each. So in Division A then, having a look at Division A first of course, we had our eight coaches. We had, looking at the teams in order that they appear on the screen, we had Chaos against Humans, Bretonians against Chaos Dwarfs, Undead against Dwarfs, and High Elves against Orcs. Good luck to the High Elves in this league. They are in a hell of a bad situation, but never mind. Funnily enough, pretty much all the games have been draws. We've only had the one win slash loss this week, and it's a surprising one, actually, to be honest. It's been a very close affair so far, in Division A at least. So having a look at the team specifically then, we have Fake running Slaanesh's favourites, the Chaos team, and we have Fallen Glory running the Humans, Spirits United. Guinness, the World Cup champion from 2016, is running Luc de la Dror, which is a Bretonian team, and I myself am running the Labyrinthians, a Chaos Dwarf team. The Old Gods are run by Andes, they are an undead team, and you made me do this is the team of Squiggy, they are the dwarves. Salt Free is Fine is run by Yasinde, High Elves, and Greenskin Red Spike Spikes is Chris J and his Orcs. Let's have a look at the actual games then. Probably should also mention that when I'm doing this, I'm going to be doing a little bit differently to Steel and the Pyramid. I'm actually going to go through every game because I didn't do a rundown of the league in general. So I'm going to look through the entire schedule and talk about the entire schedule as well as next week specifically. Just wanted to add that little bit before I moved on. Alright, let's start this off with game one in Division A then. We have Fake's Chaos, Slanisha's favourites against Fallen Glorious Humans, Spirits United. And I don't think I have any direct information for this. Let's have a look. Fallen Glory. We've been talking a lot recently, so it's going to take me a, a second or two to find it. Da 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 da. I'm sure I did get something from him, so that's surprising. Maybe it's in the chat itself. Or maybe they didn't really say much in the end. Okay, well, I'm not going to spend forever looking for it. At the moment, it looks like there's nothing. So if there is, sorry, guys. Uh, so, fake is chaos. One touchdown, one pass, one death. That's bad news. And 11 armor breaks. And Beastman, injured Beastman, got MVP. Humans, one touchdown, one pass, 10 armor breaks. And human... Lineman also injured, also got SPP, no, MVP. Wow, that's 11, and that's 10, 14, 17. No levels, but let's have a look at the injuries then. So, Chaos, starting with Chaos. Oh wow, that looks like it's a warrior that's dead. Yikes. Okay, that's hard. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that was a warrior, so we have, yeah, definitely one team reroll. That must have been a warrior dead. That's really harsh. So, one dead warrior. And nothing else to report. It said that one was injured. That's interesting. He must have been badly hurt, not badly injured. Yeah, <laughs> funny. Well, we got three beasts in, uh, sorry, two beasts in range, one with one SPP. And uh, we've got the Minotaur with two SPP from the game, so that looks like it was a hard one for Chaos. Let's have a look at their follow-up matches then, let's see how they're going to do. So next week they've got me. I don't think that's a good draw for them, especially with their Chaos Warrior gone. And uh, we both have a Minotaur, so they're going to cancel each other out. The two Bull Centaurs are going to cancel out the Chaos Warriors, and yeah, it's going to be a rough match for him, I think, but um, I'm sure he can come through. After that, he has the Orcs, also a difficult match for him. Oh god, he's got all the hard ones first. 
well, his whole league is hard to be fair, but that's another very difficult one for him. Though hopefully he'll have some pieces back by then. Yeah, I think he's going to struggle these first few weeks. Then he's got Undead. It really doesn't get easier, does it? Mm-hmm. Followed by... Uh, dwarfs. Then he finally has a slightly easier draw, at least on paper, against Bretonians, but they're going to be quite developed by that point, so I don't know how good that's going to be. And he's going to end with the Hyles. And all of his basic kill things are going to be useless by then, so if he makes... Well, if I was him, I'd be making the team to prepare for these last three games, and with a mix of murder and a mix of anti-agility. That's the best way to act, because you're going to have a late run from Chaos, I think, because the first four games are really hard for him. But there's that. Uh, having a look at Fallen Glory... Oops, why did that do that? Having a look at Fallen, Glo Fallen Glory and his team then. Where are you, humans? Where are you? Where are you? Where are you here? So, nothing permanently injured, nothing leveled up. We've got Catcher within range, he can score again. We've got a Lineman within range, not really worth it. And then SPP spread out a bit. And looking at their matches coming up in the next few weeks. Yeah, so, having a look at the matchups for next week, then we've got. You made me do this, the dwarfs from Squiggy. That's going to be a really hard match for him, both in terms of the race he's playing and the coach he's playing, and the combination of the two. So, that could go well or badly, we'll see. Next up, we go the Bretonians. Bretonians in general are quite a good matchup for humans, but of course, Guinness is a very good coach, so it's hard to say how that's going to go, just looking at it. And following on from there, we've got the Orcs, which is always a classic. It can go either way. We're going to be kind of middly developed by then. So, I don't know. That's a hard one to call, actually. Followed by... The Salt Free is fine. That's the High Elves. That's a pretty good matchup for humans. They're maybe not so late, because there's going to be a lot of blodge in the team. Yeah, fallen has got a tough road ahead of him. Then we have Undead. A developed Undead team is going to be hard work for the humans as well. And finally, myself. And I think I prefer humans over Chaos Dwarfs late on, so that's going to be a hard match for me. Though, Fallen has a really tough road ahead of him, so he's going to have to play really well to get out of this league, I think. But I wish him luck. I mean, look at game number two then in Division A. This is my game against Guinness with his Bretonians. It was a tough old game for the two of us. I think we uh, we really struggled to make anything, get anything out of this game. Uh, dice were a small factor as well, but overall it was just we kind of cancelled each other out. I think, for the most part, with a little bit of dice help at times on both sides, and uh, a little bit of outplaying each other on both sides. So it was a it was a difficult match, that's for sure. So the Bretonians, Blitzer got Man of the Match, which is great, and the Chaos Dwarf got Man of the Match for the Chaos Dwarfs, which is also great. Four armor breaks and ten armor breaks, that's the only real difference. And it was a small SPP match, it was just a two SPP match, so the five five two. Nothing really happened in the game in the end. Just lots of positioning play basically. Starting off with Luc de Ledraw of course, nothing is new, though he does have a lineman who is in his next game. He has enough for an apothecary, or he has enough for an extra lineman. I would take the apothecary personally, but it'll be interesting to see what he decides to take. And having a look at his games going forward. So, Orcs first, which is really bad news for him. He had Chaos Dwarfs first, which is a hard matchup, and then he has Orcs directly afterwards. That's a tough old start for the Bretonians. He gets slightly better against the humans, though. Uh, it's still going to be hard for him, of course, but it's a slightly fairer matchup, I think. Following that, we have 
the High Elves, which at least is relatively early, so he can pull something off with that. And then the rest of the bash, we have Undead, that's maybe one of the best matchups for him as well at the moment, and it's relatively late, so that's maybe not so bad. Then we have the two rough ones at the end. Uh, did you know Chaos? Depends how Chaos is developed, basically. But uh, Chaos can be a hard draw for him for certain. And finishing with the Dwarves, which is probably going to be his hardest game. So... I have faith in Guinness, but at the same time it's going to be hard for him to come out of this. First of all in one piece, and second of all with a good record. He's going to struggle, I think, especially because he's quite new to the team. Though I wish him luck going forward. And having a look at my team then. Oops, wrong screen. And having a look at my team. Gotta stop doing that. The Labyrinthians. And we've got just the five on the Chaos Dwarf and the two on the Hobgoblin, which is not really important. And then having a look at our games going forward then. So we've got, first of all, We've got the Chaos, which is um, it's going to be an interesting matchup, and I know that the chaos, they're missing a Chaos Warrior, so that's going to go heavily in our favour, I think. Though, the two teams might basically balance, balance each other out, because we've got the same amount of strength for we've both got the Minotaur, and everything else is everything else. I think my block will make a difference, though, so I give myself a slight edge, but only a slight one. Following on from that, we've got the Undead. I'm glad I've got them early, that's all I can say. Though Andy's is always a difficult coach to play against, and it's going to be a tough match for sure, though I'm glad I've got them early, so at least we've got them early development. Following that, we've got the Dwarves. This is going to be a key fight. I think the Chaos Dwarves against the Dwarves, and Smoko is such a good... Uh, not Smoko, sorry. Squiggy is such a good coach that... Smoko's a good coach as well, but Squiggy, who is running these dwarves, is such a good coach that this game is always going to be difficult. I'm going to have to make movement work for me here, and kind of depends on who has levels. I should have all six dwarves by that point at least, but depending on how we've leveled them and who has more guard may make the day in that matchup. Then we got the orcs quite late. I'm not sure if that's good or bad, to be honest. Well, Chris J is always a difficult coach to play against as well. They're all difficult coaches to play against. But... Yeah. Not sure how that one's going to go. If I'm happy or not about that one. Then we have the High Elves when they have all their blodge, but I'm going to have all the tackles, so it's not such a big deal. Hopefully some Hobgoblins will have some tackle as well by then. And lastly, we have the Humans. And... Late developed humans are always difficult to play against, but I quite like my chances against humans to be fair. With no with all due respect to Fallen Glory, who's a fantastic coach, but I'm quite happy that I've got the fast teams last, because I can develop a little bit to counteract them. Anyway, that's it for the second game. Moving on to game three then, and this game was quite a bit of a shock actually. Uh, I wasn't expecting to see the dwarves lose so heavily to the undead, and I wasn't even expecting to see this coach lose so heavily. If anything was a draw, I would have called this a draw, so I'm not sure what happened here. Let's have a quick look to see if one of the coaches has told me something. I haven't heard anything from Squiggy, I know that much, but Andes maybe. Where are you, Andes? Andes, Andes. Oh god, you're all the way down there. Mm, no, which is fair enough, because like I think I've already mentioned, I haven't been asking coaches to give me rundowns of these games specifically, so no surprise that they haven't done it yet. But, but for future reference, guys, by all means do give me rundowns, I'll have a look at these as well. So on the side of Andy's Undead, we've got two touchdowns, 11 armor breaks, and Dancing Zombie got MVP. Nut. He actually looks like Rot, his name is close to Rot, but he's Nut. And, of course, they won 2-0 against the Dwarves, that had nine armor breaks, and forgive me, the Drinking Dwarf got MVP. Neva leveled up. Having a look at SPP in general, 7 against 13. Fair enough. 
And having a look at the teams then, starting with the undead team. So we've got, of course, two ghouls in touchdown level up range. And a zombie that is one away. And I am also a zombie in this team, which is a, which is quite cute. I like that. That's quite funny. Thank you for that. Uh, more likely to be a skeleton, but still a zombie will do. Uh, we got three team rerolls still, and we've got the one fan factor. So I don't think anything is new in this team. We got sixty thousand to spend if we want to. Could buy another zombie, or could buy a skeleton. Could buy a skeleton. Could buy a skeleton. Though I really wouldn't recommend buying a skeleton, to be honest. Uh, zombies are better. I just like skeletons for some bizarre reason. Having a look at his uh, upcoming matches then. Having a look at Andy's upcoming matches, I mean. So, second match is against High Elves, which is... Hmm. Yeah, I think that's a good matchup early on for the Undead. Following on, we've got myself, the Chaos Dwarves, which is going to be a hard matchup for him, I think. Though... He's a better coach, so he's got that in his favour. Uh, but it's a bad team to be facing off against, I think, because of all of the block and because of the strength advantage being... Well, no, actually, he's still got the two mummies, whereas I've only got the Minotaur and I've got two strength fours instead of two strength fives. I have a slight strength advantage, but it's not huge. And if we do manage to get level ups by this point, it's going to be a deciding factor in the match as well, I think, for either team. Then he's got the Chaos. Kind of depends how much Chaos have developed by that point, but three games in, they're not likely to develop much, so can't really look past Undead for that one. Then the Bretonians, quite late on. Um, I think this is harder than it looks, but Undead against Bretonians is usually a good matchup for Undead. Then we have the humans towards the end, which is bad news for the undead, I think. That's going to be a difficult matchup. We're probably going to look at a draw there. That's going to be one of the key matches for the undead this season, I think. And then lastly, the orcs. So he's got the two the two opponents that are kind of feared for undead at, right at the end. So yeah, that's, that's quite rough, actually. Those two games are going to be deciding games for Andes this season, indeed. He certainly has a chance of getting out of the round and going towards the KO. I don't remember who I said was probably going out now, but um, looking at the teams when they're all in front of me here, I think the Undead have a very good chance, actually. A very good chance. I can quite easily see Orcs, Humans, Undead, and one of the Dwarves. Or... Yeah, that's most likely, and one of the dwarves. It depends on how much Chaos managed to develop, and it depends how much High Elves managed to dodge and survive. And Bretonians, I don't know, Guinness is pretty scary with Bretonians, so I'm not counting him out at all, but uh, I think it's going to be a difficult season for him for certain. That's the way I see Andes, and looking at the dwarves then. Ooh, that was good. Sorry, go back to where I should be. The dwarves then, you made me do this. Squeeze dwarves. We've got a long beard within range, of course, and another long beard, which is two, and that's all of the development so far. We do have the apothecary, we do have rerolls, we have no cash. And I think we have an 11 man roster. Uh, 8, 10, 11, yes, we do. So, nothing, nothing exciting to talk about there, really. Let's have a look at Squiggy's matchup for the coming games. So, next up, he's got. Where are we? He's got the humans, which is a. Good match early on for Dwarves, I think. If you want to get humans, you want to get them early, so... Yeah, I can see Fallen and Squiggy going toe-to-toe -to -toe in that one, and it's going to be a tough match for both of them. I think I said that when I was talking about the human team as well, so... That's going to be an interesting one. Though I do f favor the Dwarves in that one. And then we've got... Salt Free is fine, the High Elves. Um, dodge isn't going to be counteracted by Tackle at this point, so the High Elves do have the Dwarves quite early, which is good for Yasinde. Uh, but Dwarves against the Elves, it always just comes down to basically whichever coach manages to do their thing better. If the Bullshit is better, or if the Bash is better, and positioning is better in general, then we can see this going quite tight. As it's so early, it's difficult to say. Uh, Squiggy has all of his key matches at the start, what can I say? And then he has me. Yeah, I remember. 
And uh, I think this is going to be the biggest match because we have a dwarf off, and the dwarf off is going to be a very important one in the when it comes to the end of the table. Um, I think the amount of block is going to be a problem for me, but I think the amount of strength is going to be a bit of a problem for Squiggy, so we'll see what happens there. Either way, it's going to come down very much to positioning from both teams. After that, he's got the Chaos team, and he's got the Chaos team late, like a lot of teams do, of course. Well, at least three teams have Chaos late. <laughs> Funny how that works, isn't it? Um, again, it depends very much on how much the Chaos have developed. Um, overall, I don't think this is a great setup for Chaos, because seven matches is enough to get you a little bit of development, but not a huge development. And with the KO, yeah, I mean, you're looking fine, but... Definitely could be better for Chaos. I mean, when I think about it, I don't think Chaos is such a good team in the setup. And following on from that, we've got the Orcs. The Orcs are going to be a key match as well. This is just a tough field for Dwarfs, to be honest. They've got all of the teams that they don't want to be facing in the same group, and then High Elves. And their last matchup they have, the Bretonians, which is going to be very much dependent on how the Bretonians are developed, I think. And how many of them are dead, because Bretonians do have a tendency to die, especially the pieces that matter. So, all in all, this is going to be a tough ride for Squiggy. He's got a lot of key matches early on, and he's got the teams that he would want to be facing early at the end. So, you know, the Dwarves got a really unlucky draw this round, and Squiggy's got to play well, basically. But Squiggy is capable of that. I've seen him do it. I've been part of it. I've been an opponent of it. So we'll see what happens there. Good luck to both Squiggy and uh, who was his opponent? And Andes during this round. Let's move on to the last game. All right, and lastly then we have Salt Free is fine. The high health team led by <coughs> excuse me Yasinde facing Greenskin Red Spikes. The Orc team led by Chris J. I think I've actually got a rundown from both coaches, so let's have a quick look. The Yusinde one is long, so let's start with that. Where is it? Luck of the dice, Salt Free is Vine, High Elf, Yusinde versus Green, Skin, Red Spikes, Orcs, Chris J. This was one of the strangest matches I've ever seen. Chris J's positional play was very good. He has an enormous talent knowledge to play smart and tactical. Every move was planned cautiously, except one. I have to learn a lot till I reach his mastery level. Yeah, Chris J is something special, it's true. First dodge in turn one resulted in a one... Uh, enrolling a one, I think, and a miss next game line elf. Down one man to orcs for 15 turns is no fun. I received first and did some vanity passes on the back as he advanced. I tried to break through. I had some bad dice but still could have scored. All I needed was a 3 plus throw into a 3 plus catch with catch with the skill catch and a 2 plus dodge and maybe a 2 plus GFI, but my catcher got snakes. Chris J nearly scored himself on turn 8 but he failed to catch a GFI, not sure what happened, so every one of us could have been in the lead, but still, nil-nil. Second half, he did the Orcish Steam Vaults. <laughs> okay, moving forward cautiously and hitting every elf, then he had some bad dice and I kind of surrounded him. He tried to break free, but I could catch him and hit the ball carrier. One turn, we both huddled around the ball, then the ball elfed into the hands of a line elf who threw it to a catcher. I needed to push the blitz him free. Next round, and wanted to potato. Chances weren't optimal, but I was down four players and rolled double skulls again. He got the ball into the hands of a line orc, and I got a one dice blitz on him on turn 15. The ball went out of the pitch, but those stupid fans threw it into my touchdown zone. I picked up the ball with another line elf just to make him more. just to make him roll more dice. Please don't write it the way you've written it. He made a free dice block, needed to push a blitz, a GFI with a black orc on my ball carrier. Uh, pick up with a blitzer, 3 plus just to fail the last roll, a 2 plus GFI. This half again, either of us could have scored, I kind of feel lucky and sad at the same time. It could have been 2-0 nil or 0-2, nil it was really weird and I think Chris J was the better player. But sometimes elfing helped me to stop a score, but another time one stopped me from elfing and scoring. Okay, that was a, that was a lot of information. And I think I also have a rundown from Chris J. I'll just have a quick look. Where is Chris J? Ah, where have you gone? Ah, there we are. Hello, Chris J. And I haven't pinned it, so that was a bad idea, because I've spoken to Chris J a lot. Let's have a quick look. Let's see if I can find something quickly. I don't think I can. Uh, no, nothing there. Let's have a quick look on Steam. 
Oh, I really need to start looking at these before I do the recording, don't I? And having a quick look at Steam, there's... That's the wrong one. Da, 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 da. Ah, there we go. There's... Yes, I found it. Right, there is one. So, you sit there, high elves. Salt free is fine versus Chris J's orcs. This is much shorter. Green skin, red spikes. Orcs failed to score twice because of a failed GFI. Basically, they tripped on the touchdown line twice. In the next training, they will learn to raise their feet higher than the lions on the pitch the hard way. Uh, that's it. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, guys, both of you. Thank you very much for that succinct breakdown and that epic breakdown. Right then, so we had on the side of Yasinde, Salt Free is Fine, where this Blitzer has been dancing the whole time I've been talking, I guess. We've had five passes, five armor breaks, and the Blitzer got MVP, which is always good news. We went nil-nil. Green, green Skin Red Spikes got one pass, ten armor breaks, and the Shrugging Blitzer also got MVP. Neither leveled up. Having a look at SPP in general, that's a lot. We've got seven, nine, ten, twelve against eight. Right then. Nothing's leveled up then. So we have a missed next game on the lineman, like Yasinde said. And uh, nothing else is new. Still don't have an apothecary. Can't afford an apothecary. That's really bad news in this lineup. Wow, that's awful for him, actually. And we've got Blitzer within range. We've got Thrower within MVP range. Catcher within MVP range. And then a couple of SPP on some linemen, but we don't really care about that so much because health linemen tend to die. Having a look at his matches then, I, this is painful in general for high elves. It's probably the worst thing they could hope for, to be honest. So, where are we? We've got Undead next week. <clears throat> yeah, I think the early games are going to be the important ones so long as they're not facing too much block. And uh, there isn't too much block in Undead, so... That one, like I think I said when I was talking about Andes, is going to be a difficult matchup for the two of them. It's going to be, it could go either way, it depends on who rolls better and who does their roll better. That was a weird combination of sentences. And then the Dwarves, I definitely said the same thing about this team. It's very much a case of whether Bullshit works better or whether Bash Positional works better. And, um, Yusinde is actually quite lucky that he's got these teams early because, uh, the teams that he he would want the teams that he is a favorite against kind of are late and that's really good for him the teams that would destroy him at high tv are early so that's good i mean there's going to be no high tv in seven matches but you know what i mean higher tv when we have a bit of development and then fourth actually he has bretonians which is probably earlier than he wants them though he's definitely a favorite in this match the two teams i mean they're definitely a favourite in this match, but um, I think Bretonian is probably the last one you want to face, so that's a bit hard for him. And he has the humans. I thought for some reason he had the humans and the Bretonians late, but he has them in the middle. Okay, he doesn't really want them in the middle, but um, at the very least, these are two teams that he has a chance against. He has a chance against every team, but he has a stronger chance against these teams because he has a slight advantage over them with the agility. Though, of course, humans can outbash him, but only just. High Elves, I think, are not too worried about humans. Not a big Elf coach, though. And then he's got me. And late Chaos Dwarves is bad news for him. I think this is going to be a tough old match for him. And uh, he's going to have to... Well, he's going to have to mostly avoid my guys in order to get anything out of this game. But um, I have faith in Yusinde. He's a very good coach. And his last matchup... Where is he? he is against the Chaos. Very much depends on how much Chaos has managed to develop. But the same is true for every game, basically. So if they are... Uh, I think I said it very early on, if Chaos actually develop themselves as a kind of anti-agility, they're going to do better this season. If they define themselves in the way that Chaos is normally divine, defined as a bash team, I think Faker is really going to struggle in the setup. And that this game will show it more than anything. If the team is anti-agility by this point, Yusinde is going to struggle. If it is very much a anti-bash team, then Yusinde is going to walk all over chaos. So, there is that. And the opponent, Chris J. Why did he go back to that? That's really annoying. Because I pressed the wrong button. Yes, I know. Right then. Chris J's green skins. 
In Group A, I think this is the only team where the coach is actually really comfortable with the team they picked up, because Chris J is quite big on Orcs. He's a, he's a very good Orc coach, to be fair. Is he better than me? I don't know. We're probably about the same, but he's a very good Orc coach. That much is certain. So we've got a Blitzer, of course, within range, and a Thrower within MVP range, and then a Lineman with a bit of SPP. He has gone for the very armor-heavy version of Orcs. Don't like this setup myself, but uh, it works for a lot of coaches. He can afford the Apothecary. Chance are that is what he's going to buy. Though he could also afford a Lineman if he does want to bench, though I would personally definitely put Apothecary before bench. Unless you're going to buy a Goblin, then I'll give you all of the accolades you need, because Goblins are awesome. Now I can see an Apothecary coming out of this. And having a look at his schedule overall then, the Orcs are ones, ones to watch, I think. The Orcs are probably the favourite in this group. Now I've looked at everything. Yeah, I think the Orcs are the favourites to go through without too much issue. So, they've got the Bretonians next. That's a good matchup for the Orcs. Low level Bretonians is just basically something to kill for Orcs, so... Um, Guinness's positioning will have a big impact on the game. But if Guinness goes toe-to-toe, -to -toe, I can see a lot of dead Bretonians out of this match. And the Orcs can basically do a slow grind into a win, so can't look past Orcs for that one, really. I think that that's a good matchup for Chris early on. It's going to put him into a slightly stronger position. Then he's got Chaos. Chaos early is also good for him because he outmatches them in terms of statistics and in terms of skills, so... Yeah, Faker's going to struggle with that matchup as well, so I can see Orcs doing well in the early stages of this tournament. Following on, we've got the Humans. This is a classic, and it's in the middle, which is interesting. Really depends on how Fallen Glory plays it. That's kind of that's kind of Chris J's problem in this league, I think. It, it, very, it very much depends on the way his opponent plays, not so much on the way that he plays himself in this setup. So, I, I think that even though this classic is always hard for both teams, I can't see the experience of Chris J being outthoughted by the inexperience of Fallen Glory, but you never know. So, I've, I can see the Orcs having a really good run this season. Then he's got me. I think this is going to be quite a big challenge for him, because it's right in the middle, and we're both going to have leveled a little bit. It kind of depends on the way he develops his team. And we'll have a look towards the end to see how that goes. Then he's got the Dwarves straight after, so he's got Chaos Dwarves followed by Dwarves. Uh, both matches are going to be hard for him, they're going to be the two key games, I think. And lastly, 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 Undead. So also a tough match, especially late on. Yeah, so he needs to kind of build into a plus strength team so he can match with the Dwarves, the two flavor of Dwarves and the Undead. Though... Yeah, I can see I can see Chris having a really good season, and Chris, I think, is favorite to go to the KO. So having had a look at literally all of the teams now, uh, I'm going to try and call it. My call is going to be Chris J definitely through. I think Undead most likely through. And then it's a case of humans are very likely as well, just because of the way the setup is more than anything else. One of the Dwarves will be the fourth knockout candidate, and then the other three teams are just Dark Horses, basically. Depends on how well they manage to do. Chaos depends on how they develop, but if they develop as an anti-adge and then they go into the KO, maybe the anti-adge is going to go against them, so it's hard to say. Uh, the High Elves very, very much depends on how much they manage to survive, and the same with the Bretonians. If they can both do well, the Bretonians and the High Elves, then we're going to be in trouble. But if they are going to struggle, then I don't think those two are really in contention for going up. Having a look at the leaderboard then, so far, this this uh, rundown is going to be very long. I apologize for that, but um, the way I've set it up, it's the way it is. So, because most people have drawn, of course, it's pretty straightforward. We've got Andy's at the top with one win, which is bad news for all of us, because Andy's is one that we all want to beat, I think. And then... Everybody but the Dwarves are on a draw, so nothing's changed there. 
And unfortunately for Squiggy, he's at the bottom as the other team that has lost. Though, like I said, that result was very shocking, so I don't know what happened there, to be honest. But I have a feeling that Dice may have had at least a little bit to do with it, because I can't see... Even though Andy's is a fantastic coach, Squiggy is too, so I can't see Andy's completely dominating him, to be honest, especially with a team he's not overly confident with. But, yeah, that's it for... No. Uh, I know I've gone through the schedule in general, but let's have a look at next week's schedule specifically. So, Chaos against Chaos Dwarves. I feel quite confident going into this game, not going to lie, because um, the Chaos have absolutely no skills. Strength is an issue. But so long as I stay off them and basically pick on their beasts, I think I've got a fairly good chance. Feke's one thing that he can really do is position really well. If he does have some fantastic positioning, I'm going to really struggle. But if he makes a couple of mistakes, I think I can capitalize on them. Whereas my mistakes are going to be less punishing. Though I'm not a great Chaos Dwarf coach, so we'll see what happens there. I don't usually bet on myself, but if I was going to for this match, I would bet on myself. No offense to Feke at all. Then we have the humans against the dwarves, and this one is almost impossible to call. I think that because Squiggy has at least some experience with dwarves, <coughs> 100 hours, <coughs> um, the humans are going to struggle a little bit because Fallen Glory doesn't have so much experience with the humans. There's still a new team to him. Uh, the ogre might help though, because he does have the ogre on the team. And Squiggy might be suffering a bit because he lost the last game, so there might be a psychological element in there as well. But, no, I'm going to put this one down to a draw. Then we've got the Bretonians from Guinness against the Green Skin Red Spikes. That's just an awful, awful matchup for Guinness, so I can't look past Chris J, really. It's going to, I mean, Guinness is a fantastic coach, that much is clear, but uh, he's going to really struggle against the Orcs, I think. And the Overwhelming experience with Orcs against the uh, one match experience with Bretonians is really going to play a part, I think. Then we've got the Undead against High Elves, and this one, like I've said a few times, it all depends on which team does what they're supposed to do more, whether the bullshit is real or whether the bash and positioning is more impressive. And he's a very good positional coach, so we'll, we'll see what happens there. Anyway, that's it for Division A. Let's move on to Division B. All right, then, and moving on to Division B. There's actually a game that hasn't been played here yet, but if I don't do this today, then I won't do it. So I'm going to do it today. So sorry, Hoy. And Top Hat, uh, I'm going to have a look at your teams before you guys actually play. But that's not such a big deal, I hope. So going down in order like we did in the last time, I will mention the races first of all, then we'll go through the coaches in the same way. So Nagash's buddies are Kemri, Ho Ho Ho's are Dark Elves, Viking El Viking Raids, sorry, are of course Norse. The butt pains are Nurgle. Luck of the Rats are of course Nurgle. No, that's Gaven. Uh Us Give Hugs are Lizardmen. Owls on Parade are Wood Elves and Brody's Chosen are Necromantic. So these are the last eight races. A slightly less bashy slightly less bashy, but slightly more agy, Division in Division B. So, and the coaches then, we have Hoi, 83 Death Metal, or Gotrick Gurnison running the Gash Buddies, the Kemri team, and we've got Top Hat running the Dark Elves, Ho Ho Ho's. Top Hat has a second name as well, though I don't remember it. Uh, Viking Raid is Varkson's Norse team, and the Butt Pains is Jackal's Nurgle team. Luck of the Rats belongs to Smoko, the Skaven team, and Us Give Hugs is of course Ook with his Lizardmen. Undo or Blashirk have Owls on Parade, the Wood Elf team, and Urban Zorro with one of his favorite teams, Brody's Chosen, the Necromantics. So Brody's Chosen is the one to watch here, as is Luck of the Rats. They're both teams that both coaches are fairly confident in playing. And, of course, the first game hasn't been played, so I can't have a look at the game itself, but I can have a look at the two teams and their following matches. So, starting with Nagash's buddies, the Camry team. This was a weird build, if I remember rightly. Yeah, it was. So we've got the four Tomb Guardians, one Blitzra, and one Frora. 
One throw R is not so uncommon, but one blitz R is really weird, and I don't really understand why he did it. I guess it was for the extra team reroll, but even if he took both blitz R's, I still think you'd have three rerolls. Maybe wrong about that. So that's maybe why. But still, an unusual build, for sure. And the five skeletons, which I like, because I like skeletons. Um, nothing else really to say about the team. All we can do is have a look at the matchups that he has. So first of all he has the Dark Elves, which is pretty awful for Kemri to be honest, because uh, Elves are pretty hard for Kemri to deal with early on. And um, even though Top Hat is not particularly confident playing Dark Elves, just so long as Top Hat stays out of the way, um, Hoi is going to really struggle running around after them, and Hoi hates Elves with a passion, so there is that as well. Next up for Nagash's buddies, we have the Necromantic Brody's Chosen. Uh, another tough matchup for Hoy, actually. The, we're going to have two early problems, I think. Kemri can certainly outbash the Necromantic team, but the Necromantic team can outrun and they have the stronger armor value. So even the Battle of Attrition is not so good for the Kemri team. Kemri's main strength, of course, is control of the pitch, so Hoy's positioning is going to be very important throughout the campaign. But his first two matchups are pretty tough. After that we've got the Lizards, which is probably the worst team for Kemri to face off against, and um, yeah, it's early at least, so at least there aren't going to be too many skills to deal with, but at the same time, really really hard matchup for Kemri all the time facing Lizards, so the first three games really hard for Koi. After that we've got Skaven. That's maybe good in the middle because Kemri have maybe managed to get a couple of skills, probably have the second Blitzerar as well by then, so we can outbash the rats for certain. But rats are always hard to fight against, so even the fourth game is hard. I think Hoy has just got a hard campaign, no matter what. Nurgle is kind of his first game where he can breathe a little, because at least they are somewhat evenly matched. But later on, Nurgle could have developed a bit, and depending on how the Nurgle team develops, can also be a problem for Kemri. Following that, we've got the other elf team, Undo, and these two guys play each other a lot, so they at least have that. But um, Wood Elves are a really bad matchup for any team, obviously. Uh, and this late, we're going to have a lot of dodge, so unless there's a lot of tackle in the Kemri team, that's going to cause a lot of problems. And lastly, we finish with Norse, which is maybe the only team where I think Kemri are potentially the favourites just because Norse have to stand off with them, and they don't want to. So that's maybe the one game I can see Hoy having a little bit of luck in, but Varkson is a very good coach, so just a really bad campaign for Hoy, to be honest. He's got, uh, he's got the teams in all the wrong order, and he would have probably been better off in Division A, because that's where all the Bash teams are, and Kemri seems to do better against Bash because they can slow down a Bash team, which is frustrating, but a speed team always difficult for Kemri to play against. So we'll see how Hoi does in his round. Then having a look at Top Hat's team, which was the Dark Elf team. Let's have a look at his setup first of all. We're going four blitzers, runner, Lyman, Lyman, Lyman. Relatively common build. It's what a lot of people recommend. Don't know why to be honest, but it is what a lot of people recommend, so we at least have that. And we've got the two rerolls, so Yep, standard build. As we go on, we'll buy the Apothecary, we'll buy a Witch, hopefully. Maybe two Witches, even. Not really too worried about this team. They're looking fine at the moment. Just hope they don't die too much early on. So, of course, first of all, Kemri. Uh, it's a good matchup for Dark Elves early on, because they can run around them a little bit. As I've already said, I'm not going to repeat myself. Then, where are we? Then we've got Norse. And Norse is a tough matchup for Dark Elves, because all that block causes quite a lot of problems. Though, Dark Elves are the elf that can kind of go toe-to-toe -to -toe with another team, so there is that in the Dark Elf favor. But if Top Hat gets too involved with the punching, he's going to really struggle in this game, just because the block is going to make a difference. But if he stays off them a little bit, and tries to get around them as much as possible, then that could go in his favor. 
Following on from that, we've got the Wood Elves. When I'm playing as Dark Elves, to be honest, if I'm going to face another Elf, I hope it's Wood Elves, because High Elves can kind of meet, meet you fist to fist, but Wood Elves can't, so at least you have that psychological impact when you're playing as Dark Elves, that you know, you can cause them damage. And if he manages to have an Assassin by this point, if he wants to go Assassin route, then that can cause a lot of problems too, though which Elf would be better just to counteract the War Dancer, because the War Dancers are going to play a big part in the setup as is made at the moment. Uh, overall though, Wood Elves can out-elf the Dark Elves, so that's always bad news for a Dark Elf team. Moving on, we've got the Necromantic, which are... I never know who to go for in a Necromantic Dark Elf team, to be honest. I always think it's kind of evenly matched, and it is bang smack in the middle of the league, so... I don't think it's going to make too much of an impact on both teams' chances. This one, This one is kind of a key match for the Dark Elves. Following on from that, we've got us give hugs the lizard team, which is a bad matchup for Dark Elves, I think. Though, if the Blitzers have developed pretty well and we have a Witch by this point, or even if we have an Assassin by this point to try and knock out some of those annoying skinks, I can see this going quite well for Dark Elves, but overall, well, pretty much whatever team I'm playing against, I don't want to be facing lizards, so <laughs> there is that. The only team I'm happy with is Orcs facing lizards. Then, following on from that, we've got the butt pains of the Nurgle team. The Nurgle team is going to be in late development for the cup setup. When I say late development, I don't mean they're going to be like 16,000, by the way, just to clarify at this point. What I mean is that they're going to have had a chance to actually get some skills. And if there's a lot of tackle in the team, Dark Elves can struggle. If there's not a lot of tackle in the team, Dark Elves can struggle with ball handling anyway. But so long as we're not passing too much and we're trying to move the ball, I can see Dark Elves being a problem for the Noble team, so that's quite a good matchup for Smoko even later on. And lastly, to end with, they've got the Rats, and Rats against Dark Elf, it's always, it always comes down basically to whoever does more damage, generally speaking. Though I think Smoko's skill and experience with the Rats is going to be a big problem for Top Hats and experience with Dark Elves. Right, that's it for game number one. Alright then, having a look at Division B game two, we got one touchdown, well, one nil to the Norse. Norse are run by our coach Barkson, he's also one of our tutors, and his team Viking Raid. And the butt pains belong to Jackal, or Yackle, and he's playing Nurgle, which he wasn't particularly happy about drawing. So we've got a draw that was kind of meh for Varkson, and a draw that was probably one of the worst things he could have hoped for for Jackal, and this first game has shown that, with a 1-0 to the Norse, though it looks like it was quite tight. Uh, let's see if I do have a rundown of this game, I honestly can't remember. Let's have a quick look, where is it? Cup. Vox, 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 uh... Yep, 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 there's nothing there. Well, Jackal says that the Norse were wearing adamantium, so obviously they were, it was difficult to break their armour. And do I have a direct message for me, brother? I don't think I do, you know? Let's have a quick look. No. No, no. Right, so, got nothing to say from the coaches themselves. Though I didn't actually tell people that I wanted them on Lock of the Dice, to be fair, this time round. So, we got one touchdown, nine arm breaks, and level up on a Zerka, which is great news for Varkson, because you want the level ups on the key pieces, especially in this setup. And the butt pains got one death, this rotter who got MVP, so that's a... Uh, that sucks. And 11 armor breaks, so they weren't wearing adamantium, they did actually get broken a bit. So I think it's a 2 SPP game, here it is, and a 10 for the Norse, that's a bad start for Nurgle. Let's have a look at the Norse team then. Obviously these teams are now finalized, they may have been changed, but we'll have a look. I'm, al I'm also gonna... nope. I'm recording this one first, sorry, I would have already said what I was about to say, so I'm not going to say it. So, Berserker within one touchdown range, Berserker within one pass range, Lineman within four, and the rest still rookie rookies. So we got the one runner, two Ulfs, two Zerkers, rest Lineman, that's the final team, and we do have the Apothecary already here. And three rerolls. It's a good Norse team actually, good setup. 
And then... Oh, interesting. That's never happened before. Hang on then. Right, when it comes back up, I'll continue this. Okay, we're back. Sorry about the internet connection and the slight break here. Right, let's have a look then. So, next up, what have we got? We've got the Dark Elves. Then we've got... Where are we? Where are we? Then we've got the Skaven. Then we've got... Owls on Parade. Ah, Wood Elves. And then... Brody's chosen right at the end. Urban Zara is necromantic. Uh, the lizards, right at the end. That's good for him, actually, because he has plenty of time to prepare. And finally, we'll finish with Nagash's buddies, which is the Camry team, I believe. Right, so the two key games for Varkson, I think, is this one against the lizards and this one against Necromantic. The rest, the rest he has a pretty good draw against and he has them really early, which is even more helpful for him. Skaven early on is good for him. Wood Elves early on is better than later on. And I think the Dark Elves, the Dark Elves may prove troubling, but um, Top Hat isn't particularly happy with his Dark Elf draw. I do know that much. So he's had a good start and I can see Varkson doing really well with the teams he has to face actually. I, I like, I like Varkson to Get out of it! Get out of it from this. What I'm looking at here, I can see him going to the KO, and I can see meeting him and giving him a hell of a game with my developed Chaos Dwarves if I get that far. That's it for Varkson then, and let's have a look at his opponent who was. Uh, where are they? Oh, the butt pains. They're here. Yeah, a two SPP match, which isn't great, and we've got a man down for the next game. Uh, it's just a Rotter at least, but still, where did the 2SPP go? He went to a Warrior at least, that's uh, that's something. That is something. Uh, we've got four Warriors, Pestigore, Beast, and four Rotters. And a Lona Rotter next game. Having a look then, specifically at the Butt Pains. Next they've got Skaven. That game could go either way, Skaven early on. Who is the Skaven coach? It's Smoko, isn't it? Yeah, I can see Smoko taking this, but um, it's going to be hard because he doesn't have. Because if Jackal can position himself well, it's going to be hard to pass the ball at least. Though I can see Smoko taking that one. He's going to have a bad, He's going to have a hard start, Jackal. Uh, then he has Brody's chosen. Yeah, that's also a tough game. He's got some really tough games. And the lizards. Yeah, but he's got he's got all the elves late on. That's that's good for him actually. We've got Kemri fifth, and the last two games are elves. Aha! Uh -huh. So we've got the dark elves sixth, and the wood elves last. That means that he can develop into a anti agility team and at least have a good game against the two elves. Though he's going to struggle early on, I think. We may see if Nurgle can make a late breakaway, but I think the first couple of weeks are going to be tough for Jackal. Anyway, that's it for game number two. Alright, let's have a look at the third matchup in Luck of the Dice Division B then. We've got Smoko with Luck of the Rats, who drew Skaven, and we've got Oog with Us Give Hugs, the Lizard Team. The Rats have won 2-1. Uh, Smoko did give me a breakdown of the game, as did Oog. Let's find Smoko first. So, match fairly balanced, 2-1 for the Rats in the end, no major damage for both part, which is always nice. After scoring in the opponent drive, Rats went too confident despite being two Rats down and almost succeeded in drawing the match. Really bad offense for me, but still, a win is a win. Luck of the rats. Uh, Nomen Omen, this is a wish, by the way. And some level ups. And I got something from Oog as well, but he left it in the main chat, so let's see if I can find it quickly. I can, actually. So, Skaven managed to steal the ball from the Skinks in the first half. Lizards were not fast enough for the return touchdown. Asaurus did a successful dodge blitz on a gutter runner. The Crocs lost his tackle zones, trying to punch when he should be on screen duty. Lizards pressured Skaven ball carrier, pinning him to the sideline in the second half, but overcommitted. Skaven wiggled out of that situation and managed to evade any other attempts at ball retrieval by following flock of Skinks, who apparently were afraid of GFIs too much, resulting in second touchdown. Then Skaven let Lizards have their own touchdown, avoiding further injuries while unsuccessfully trying to inflict some themselves. 
and then level up, level up, level up. Fine. So then, we have two touchdowns for the rats and three armor breaks. And Scutter on our MVP plus touchdown, giving him a level up. And Croxigo MVP, that's always nice. One touchdown and five armor breaks. Let me look at the SPP then, we've got the one level up only, this one gutter runner. Okay then, having a look at the team, sorry, wrong screen. E D D D D D look at the rats that they are. So that one gutter runner, of course, has been given block. And we have an MSG, MSG, MNG on a lineman. Also, the apothecary is already bought. I don't remember if that was before. I guess so, though, because he still has 90,000. So we can spend that if he wants to. The knowing smoker with rats, I don't think he will. And us give hugs, then. Yeah, we've got the crocs and a skink in range. And still no apothecary here. That's a shame. But there we go. That's it for those two teams. And I've done this in the wrong order now, haven't I? Well, having a look at the next matches for the rats... Luck of the Rats have Nurgle next, then uh, da, 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 then Norse, that one's going to be a hard one for them, it's too early. Then we have, then we have uh, Kemri, followed by High Elves, uh, Wood Elves, sorry, followed by, do, do, do. no, yeah, it was right, Wood Elves, where is he? Necromantic right at the end, that's a good draw for him. And where are they? Dark Elves to finish. Well, the Dark Elf match is going to be a hard one as well, because they're both going to be pretty well developed teams by then. Yeah, I like him. I like Smoko to go right through there here. I can see him as a definite contender for the knockout. Yeah, no problem considering that at all. And having a look at the Lizards while we're here as well. So us give hugs have the wood elves next. Sounds good. But I think you prefer to have wood elves a bit later as lizards, maybe. Though so long as your defense is good, you have a good chance against them actually. Then after that we have the Kemri, which is always a bad matchup, especially early on, so I, I can imagine that Kemri will suffer in that one. Followed by Nurgle which is also going to be a tough match for the opponent, so I can see the Lizards doing well there. And the Dark Elves quite late. You want the Elves later, I guess, so that's a pretty good draw too. Then, then, then. Norse right at the end, which is pretty good, because all of Norse's benefits will be outmatched, because there'll be a lot of block probably in this team by then. And lastly, and lastly, Necromantic. That's probably going to be their hardest game, to be fair, and the one they've just played. So, and the High Elves, because they've got them early. Yeah, if they can do well in these three games, I can see them doing alright, though I have Lizards as an outside chance at the moment, just because I think Ulg is struggling a little bit with the Lizard setup. So, if he gets past the teething problems, no problem there. That's it for game number three in Division B. Alright, having a look at B, game number four then, the last game of Luck of the Dice then. Finally, the Wood Elves against Necromantic. Wood Elves led by Undo, Owls on Parade, and Necromantic led by Urban Zorro, Brody's Chosen. Wood Elves I don't think was such a bad pick for Undo, and Necromantic couldn't have been much better for Urban Zorro. It's one of the teams he's particularly good at playing, so uh, I'd be surprised if he doesn't do well. Uh, props to Undo though for holding him to a draw with a team he's not very familiar with, so well done there. I haven't heard much about this game. I've heard some kind of post-match discussion between Oog and Undo, but I haven't heard anything specifically about the game, so I'm not going to go into the post-match stuff. So one touchdown, one pass, four armor breaks. And one touchdown, 18 armor breaks. Whew. And Lineman and Zombie got MVP. Zombie actually leveled up. If that isn't a dirty player, I don't know what a dirty player is. So we got 9 for the Wood Elves, and we got 10 for Brody's Chosen. So we got one level up, just the zombie. Let's have a look at the teams, though. Starting off with the Wood Elves, they have a lineman out next match, and he has actually been moved and broken anyway. Yeah, I'm, I can see him being fired, to be honest. 
I'd be a bit surprised if not. We got a five on alignment, a one on alignment, and we've got a touchdown away with the War Dancer. The War Dancer obviously scored the touchdown in the match. Yeah, Rocky like a hurricane. I can't see him lasting much longer, though the Apo is maybe a priority, so maybe Apo's coming next game. We'll see. Having a look at the forward games then. So, where are we? Owls on Parade. We have Lizards next. That's rough. He's got to do well in this game, I think, to have a good chance of getting out. Then we have the Dark Elves. That's going to be a tough match as well, though I like Wood Elves over Dark Elves, especially in early development. Later on, we have... Yeah. Not a great time... Not a great time to be facing Norse. Followed by the Skaven late on. Probably Skaven late is good because we can develop a little bit, maybe get a little bit of kill stats. Uh, the Camry right at the end, which is pretty good for Wood Elves, I think, because you can develop into a big dodgy team and you can make a big mess of Camry like that. And lastly, Nurgle. So the last two matches. Well, the last match is hard. Depends how Jackal develops his team. If Jackal goes more the kill route, then it'll be an easy match for the Wood Elves. If he goes more the anti edge route, then it's going to be a hard match for the Wood Elves. And Camry, I think, is going to be one of the best times to play them here. Though, if he's facing a lot of tackle, he's going to struggle. And that's about it for the Wood Elves. Uh, I like the Wood Elves out, actually. Yeah, I think they've got a good chance of promoting to the KO at the moment. Uh, oh, I didn't want to go there. What happened there? Oh, well. Sorry. Coming back to have a look at Urban Zorro and Brody's Chosen. I can't believe he got Necromantic still. So we had the one level up, and he's got Kick, actually. That's a, that's a very good choice. That's going to give you some real help early on. Oh, I like it. That's very clever, Urban. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to click on him. Very clever. So we got three team rerolls. We got 4,000. He can buy another player if he wants to. We might see another zombie. We might not. Uh, da, da, da. Yeah, I've always nothing new. Let's have a look at his schedule then. So next he's got the Camry. Yeah, Camry early is maybe good for Necromantic actually with the kick as well. The kick's going to make a huge difference against Camry. So there is that. And then next up we will have the Nurgle. I think he prefers to have Nurgle early as well, just because he has better chance of moving the ball than later when you can really make it difficult for pieces to pick up the ball with Nurgle. Then we have the Dark Elves. Dark Elves in the middle is rough. That's a pretty 50-50 match, though um, I think that Urban Zorro's experience with Necromantic is going to win in the day, to be honest, against the Dark Elves. Uh, then we have Norse, uh, fifth. This is, going to be a, this is a tough match to call. I think I said the same when I was looking at Voxen's. Though, I think this is going to be one of the key matches for both teams here. Whichever one wins is more likely to be at the top of the league, basically. I like these two to go up. And, and, and... Then we have the Rats. Late. That's bad news for him, actually. Because the Rats will be developed, hard to put down. Yeah, that's going to be a key match as well for Necromance. Necromantics. Especially with Smoko leading them. And lastly... The Lizards at the end. Ouch, he's enough to face a developed lizard team. Well, whoever has to face the developed lizard team is going to be in trouble, and I think Urban Zorro is going to be in trouble. So, I still like Urban Zorro to go up, though. I think he's definitely one of the options, as is Undo, and this first game being a draw. Yeah, they're both very much in this cup. Well, obviously, first week everyone's very much in this cup, but... If you get a good result first, then you've got a better chance of getting good results later, basically. So yeah, that's it for game number two. Having a look at the leaderboard so far then, keeping in mind, of course, that one game has not been played, so there are two teams that are not here yet. It's been a slightly more... Well, there have been slightly different results from Division A. We've actually had two wins against two losses, so Skaven and Varkson are at the top with a win apiece. The Wood Elf and Necromantic team drew, which is... Bad news for, for Wood Elves, I think. Good news for Urban Zorro. 
and the Lizards and Nurgle unfortunately both lost their first match, which is quite unusual for Lizards, even though they were playing Skaven, which is one of the harder matches for them. So we had a couple of key matches here actually. I think this Lizardman and the Skaven was a key match, so that went Smoko's way. And I think this was a key match for both teams, and they drew, and I think the drew helps the draw, sorry, helps Urban Zoro more than Undo. Now having a look at the schedule for next week. So we have Kemri against Necromantic. Difficult to say, but I think experience will pan out, and I'll give that to Urban Zoro. Us give Hugs the Lizardman against Owls on Parade, the Wood Elves. Oh, that's a really hard one. Um, yeah. Very much depends on what works, whether the Lizards manage to do some damage, or whether the Wood Elves manage to do a lot of bullshit. Uh, both teams are actually capable of doing bullshit as well, so there is that in both teams' favor. I don't know, let's, I'll put that down to a draw. I don't want to have a favorite there. Uh, the Nurgle against the Skaven, that's going to be a bad matchup for Nurgle, I think, so I can't look past Smoko there. And the Dark Elves against Norse. Norse on paper are definitely better there, so I'll just punt for Varkson with that last matchup. In terms of who I think is going through, let's have a look at the leaderboard, it's easier. I I think Smoko was a shoe in to go up, and I actually think Valkson has a good chance as well. So at the moment, the two that are at the top, I think, are going to stay near the top or at the top. Urban Zorro, I think, is a good favorite to go up as well, and then it's going to be a case of whether the Wood Elves can be more Wood Elfy, or whether the Lizards can do Lizard stuff. I'm not going to put Nurgle, Kemri, or the Dark Elves out, but the inexperience of the free coaches with the free teams, I think, are going to play a big impact, and Nurgle and Kemri have a very, very steep learning curve, and Dark Elves, if played badly, can really have a bad season, so yeah, I think Top Hat's inexperience is going to hurt him a little bit in his chances to get into the KO. So, chances are that these two are going through with Urban Zoro and one of either Undo or Ulk. That's my call for the KO. Alright, that's it for the Luck of the Dice rundown in general. Thank you very much for watching. If you do want to give me rundowns of your Luck of the Dice matches, that will also help me. I will do a rundown for Luck of the Dice probably even after my holiday, so I, I hope to be back for week two. Though if I can't manage it, then I will do week two and week three together. But either way, there's going to be a rundown every week like there is with Steel and the Pyramid. Thank you for watching, good luck in your matches, and I'll see you all soon. May nothing smile on you all. Bye-bye for now.